Okay, Woo-hoo. we are set. Good morning. This is actually afternoon in your time, Reverend David. Thank you so much for coming uh, to do this recording with me. I'm excited that you are here. Uh, I'd like you to first start by introducing yourself. This is uh, telling your stories. Uh, this YouTube, the intention is to, be able to tell the stories of missionaries, African and African American missionaries, particularly, but all missionaries, and just see how can we inspire and just influence the lives of others. So if you would introduce yourself, tell us a little about you, that would be amazing. Well, before I start, I want to thank you, woman of God, Sir Vilma. Thank you so much for this opportunity and this platform. And thank you for all that you avail yourself for God to use you to do in the in the in the global church. It is really making an impact when we, we watch the things you are doing, trainings and all that. It's really been a blessing. Well, <laughs> um, I am Reverend David Abubekar, originally from Ghana. Um, I grew up in Ghana. I moved to Asbury um, in 2017. And, and since then, I have been here trying to finish a PhD and pastoring as well. And so <laughs> I, I am now in between spaces while I passed, while I, I am on the mission field, still studying to equip ourselves. And uh, that is what I am doing now. And so Ghanaian grew up in, in Ghana, uh, pastor's kid. And so uh, I grew up in the church, but um, I... I mean, should I go into the story of how I got saved? Oh, yes, <laughs> that would be amazing, yes. Yes, even though I grew up in the church and I, I, was, I was a pastor's kid, I think it was in high school. That is when I, uh, during the gospel rock show, we used to have um, Saturday evening where we have people coming in to mm. um, sing. And then, so it was during one of those, oh, uh, wow. I remember I made a commitment to God and mm. The life before and the life after, um, it's been an amazing journey. Amen. That's, yes. that's a little about me. Yeah. Um, wow. Thank you so <laughs> much for sharing. Yeah, you came yes. to Asbury the same year I was living. Yes. <laughs> yeah, because you, I, think I, I left in May, you came in August. In August. Because I think August. when we met, we met in New Room Conference. And uh, yeah. yeah, Asbury said, did, when you came, did Dr. Tennant preach the sermon, um, Scholars on Fire for Orientate? Oh my God. If you go to my Facebook, that is my, my tag name. That is, that is actually what made me know that I was in the right place. Scholars on it's, Fire. <laughs> it's funny because um, uh, before, I, before I came, yeah. Uh, one of the things the Lord spoke to me was uh, from Liberia. I said, why, as, why are they educated, unanointed, and the anointed, uneducated? Wow. So when I came yeah. and he was like, scholars on fire, I was like, oh, wow, yes, education and anointing together in one place. That was, yes. that was eye-opening for me. In <laughs> fact, uh, I, and you know, back home, most of the scholars are, even though before they came to school, they were in evangelism and all that, when they come okay. back, they just remain in the academia and yeah. it's all head knowledge. And yes. so actually academy was one of the things I didn't want to get into <laughs> at all. But there was um when I came to the US and I was still trying to discern my call, see mm-hmm. what God uh, God had and maybe I'll, I'll I'll talk about my life, yeah. what I used to do. And then um brother Kofi Amwati, he was already in the PhD. He said, yeah. whilst you are discerning your call why don't you come to the seminary? And then I came and my first preaching I had was this. I was like, whoa, yeah. I am in the right place. Yes, yes. <laughs> we that's have right. who are still not on ice, but who are on mm-hmm. fire for the Lord yeah. in the mission field. Yeah. It, it was an eye-opening message for me. I loved it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just think like, there's just so much need for scholarship because it's important that our theologists write as we try to impact and make disciples. Right. Uh, but then there are times, I think many people are afraid for the same reason because many of the scholars you see are like on ice and you wonder, is scholarship, will I lose my fire when I have to get <laughs> go to school and all of that? So well, yeah. I think we, we have proved that that is wrong. We can still yes. be on fire and still, and still be correct up there. Yes. <laughs> With our theology <laughs> right. And our heart, right? Um, yeah, that, yeah has been, that has been the journey, and I think that's, that's awesome. something Asbury 
uh, is doing well with. Uh, they keep yeah, them. as very uh, I think they do a good, good, good job with that. Yeah. So let's transition. Tell us how did you get? How were you called to ministry? Oh yes, I well, as soon as I got I got saved in high school. I somehow got involved in that same group that came to preach. Um, and so after high school, I was, I was, I joined them. We were reaching out to other high school students and then all that. But because of my background, live, uh, growing up as a pastor's kid, even though I recognized the, the call from that time, I determined that I was not going to go into full time ministry. <laughs> I did everything just to remain and support, just be in the background. I'm still on the mission field. I'm still doing this. So that is what I was doing. So I was choosing courses, even in college. I chose courses that wouldn't get me close to ministry. I went to do banking and finance. <laughs> I knew, I knew, I, even though I knew the call was there, I went to do banking and finance. And after college, I was still very active with the group. I was active in my church. I was part of the lay, I was a lay preacher in my church. And so after college, after doing my national service, I got an employment in a, in a bank. I worked for 10 years. All that while I knew within me, it was just to, 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 to run away from uh, yeah. the calling. But in the eighth year, eighth year in the bank, then things started. <laughs> there was a stirring. There was a stirring. I knew I was just doing the banking to just get the bills paid. Uh, was, mm -hmm. There was there was there was no fulfillment about it. It's just maybe weekends that you just go on the street or you join them to go to schools. There was something I knew there was more. And because of my hardened heart, I was just postponing it. And so for back almost two years i was there were a series of events that god was using to just draw my mind to i employed i had reason to become a manager so the money was good yeah. <laughs> and, and, but there were a series of issues i employed a guy who ran away with somebody's fifty thousand dollars and I, oh. I mean there were a lot of issues and uh, i remember I I just got into prayer again. And then uh, one day in the office, I heard clearly, as soon as I sat in my, in my desk, I heard clearly in my ears that this is the last time I'll deliver you. Mm. I won't do it again. I was like, whoa, what am I supposed to do? Well, I, go back and I, I don't want to. I don't want to do this ministry thing, especially. I don't. So God, what do you want me to do? Then I remembered all that time I had a green card. So I could I could relocate to US. And, and so I was like, okay, maybe whilst figuring out um, what God wants me to do, let me just go to US. And then I can, because I can't just leave the bank and then just be there not knowing what to do. And that was a God move. I mean, looking mm. back, I know that God was orchestrating all that. Yeah. Then I got in touch with um, Reverend uh, Kofi Amwati, who was then in Asbury. Yeah. And then he got me in touch. And so Asbury, what it did for me whilst I was doing the MDF, helped me to descend the call mm -hmm. to confirm, even though it was always there. Yeah. And even though I knew I was choosing my own path, Mm -hmm. Time in seminary actually made me made me discern the missionary nature of the call. Yeah. Made me discern what exactly God wanted me to do. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, this has been the most fulfilling part of my of my life now. Just serving and even schooling. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, that is how I came to to respond to the call. So the call was already there, but I it took a while for me to respond. Yeah. And maybe somebody is, is in a similar situation. I will tell you, I know my life, even though I was serving God my own way and surrendering and serving him his way, the mm. fulfillment I have now and then, there's a vast difference. So, so if, if you know that call is there, just get in touch with people who are, who are experienced, who will walk with you 
and yeah. obey that call. The earlier, the better. I wish I had done this. Oh yes, about a decade ago. I agree. <laughs> the the earlier, the better. better. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's there's nothing like that, like being in the will of God and knowing yeah. that I am doing what God wants me to do. Mm-hmm. And so, since that is how my journey, the call was there. I responded, but it was a partial ob- obedience. Yeah. And then uh, circumstances brought me back on my knees. And God, being gracious enough, has given me a second yes. chance mm-hmm. in, in ministry. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's amazing how merciful He is that at times we pick it's our happy. path and we feel like this is good. It's and He's like, I love you so much. And it's what I plan is just better than what you think. Yeah. And the, the, the thing is, the day Dr. Tennant preached that message, do you know the hymn they sang before? And can it be? And can it be? Yes, <laughs> and can it be? <laughs> yeah, and can it be? The words were just, it just prepared me for that message. I knew I was in the right place. And I've never mm-hmm. regretted taking that decision to leave the bank and then come in, come in here. So God okay. is so merciful. So yeah. merciful. Praise God. Praise God. Okay. So what, what does being a missionary in North America look like for you? What does that mean? Wow, that's a tough one. <laughs> As I said, I was I was used to ministry back home. And then, you know, back home, there's a way we go about our missions. But I realized this is a totally different um, contest. Um, certain things are not allowed, certain things. So you, that was the first shock. <laughs> you know, where you are excited, with our excitement, you think everybody will be excited to 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 hear the gospel, but I yeah. realized that the approach needs to be needs to be different. Yeah. And so in this comparing the two in this contest, um, in Africa or in Ghana, I didn't need to really appeal to people's uh, by reasoning. I just did it. Share, <laughs> share my testimony, share a few things, and then people would respond. But here. It's it's more. I have come to see that the mo- the most effective is is a relationship, yeah. kind of. It's not just a one hit and run. No, not just preach and there you go. But as you build relationship, they they become comfortable with you. Then mm-hmm. through it, you share the gospel, and so it is. It is a different contest where the approach is different. It's different, but because human need is the same. People still need God. You have to find a way through the Holy Spirit. Will give you ways of doing it. And my time here, I've I've been with the people who are from here, and I'm now pastoring an African church. That is also uh, <laughs> another challenge we will get into, where uh, you you have a split membership. Some are still used to the old ways we are doing things, but the youth and the youthful ones have also come to appreciate their contest and so yeah. would ministry in a in a different way. And so as a pastor, you are always kind of in a limbo. How do you do you please the people back home, people, the older people, or this? It's challenging. But what it has done for me is more is, is to depend on the Holy Spirit more. Mm-hmm. Every moment of an encounter, you are seeking God that in what ways can you use this? Mm-hmm. So I don't take conversations lightly. I don't take mm-hmm. preaching lightly. I don't take, uh, even when you are taking coffee at the Starbucks, you can get into conversation. Sometimes yeah. when you are doing Uber, you can get into conversation. So yeah. it, is, it, is, it is in Africa, it was kind of when I'm standing and preaching, I know this is ministry. Yeah, everything could be ministry, yeah. but you, you still have to be careful how you go around it. And the Holy Spirit is, is, is helping us. It's very, very challenging. Yeah. Because because we don't know their terrain that well. But yeah. it's, it's fulfilling. It's, but I think it also pushes you to grow. Like there's, yes. you, there's no way to settle because you are constantly pressing into the Holy Spirit, studying and yes. like God, how how so there's no there's no comfort zone where you feel like oh because somehow I feel like a back home when you've done ministry for a certain time you know what is expected you yes. just know yes. and so it's easy to become comfortable yes. and become a little complacent well not really complacent but you're like 
this is my comfort zone. I know I can jump up in the morning and just go preach a sermon. Yes. But you can't. You can't do that here. You can't. Yes. <laughs> you can't do that. You can't do that here. And that is that is the challenge. I think if and that is the right word you've used. It forces you to grow. You yeah. know, even even it forces you the things you already know. Sometimes you have to read, read. Sometimes you have to reshape. Yeah. <laughs> even your approach. It is a mm -hmm. learning process, and um, I'm, I'm growing alongside because I have seen. Even in the same church, ministering to the youth, it has to be on a different level. Uh, my older people are used to my old <laughs> way, so <laughs> I think missionaries here are always in that in that limbo. But that is that is good for us. Yeah. It makes us not um, not to be to be stuck in our old ways, but to learn. So growing, growing is the is the way. And yeah. I and this year I, I visited Ghana. I had opportunities to minister. I realized that, <laughs> I, I, you know, you can't minister. I, I, I couldn't minister like I used to. It was a different terrain. And then surprisingly, they appreciated it. So it means as we are growing here, we need to let our people over there to also grow because of internet and globalization. Yes. The expectation of the people have changed, but some of our pastors are still stuck back home in our old way. <laughs> That is, I fear for the next generation over there because they want a different, a different approach. But yeah. maybe some of our pastors are so. That's why these platforms are very, very, very good. For, yeah. for you, you were so right because I did a conference, and it's true. The conference was we had some younger people, but I'm thinking we had some pastors and Bible school students. And there were some sessions that I did. As people were like, "You're talking over our heads." Yes, and I was like, "No." So I had to like go back down and I'm like, whoa, you yes. don't understand how much you have shifted or you've changed wow. and until you go back and you're trying to like speak and people are like, oh no, you are over our heads. Can you come down? Yes. And I'm like, we, we are in trouble if we don't do anything. No, so. That was my experience. That's why sensitivity to the contest is very, very yes. important. As yeah. you grow, as you share the word, mm -hmm. um, my, one of my, my friends, um, uh, Reverend Emmanuel Afo, he was he he was telling me about uh, he's one person that I talked to about uh, these things. You may have the the word, but the skill to bring it out, the yeah. Lord should help you. That is where a lot of uh, as uh, you, you you have the revelation. He calls it revi. <laughs> you have the revelation. But the skill to bring it out is also yeah. right, being sensitive to your contest and even the cultural settings. So I went back. I was. I, I said it was a Sunday here. I was going to. Then I realized after interactions. That's why feedback is very important. Yes. In mission, in mission, it's very, very important. Mm -hmm. As you minister, you watch the posture of the people. You watch how they are accepted and all, all that. It is really, really uh, good. We are growing. I yes, we are growing. Yeah, it's a good growth, though. It's a good growth. Yeah, it is in so, a positive way. It helps way. us to know. Okay, what are the what are the pluses on this side? What are the pluses on that side? How can we bring that together so that yeah uh, we are able to make an impact on it's, yeah it's a continuous process. Yeah. Uh so um uh, let's transit. Well, I don't know if it's transition because you already talked a little about it about specifically ministering to the Ghanaians in yeah. North America. So yes. tell us a little about that. What are the similarities? What are the challenges then? Yes, I I think that um, that's the challenge I have with even the the literature on the diaspora church. Um, mm -hmm. uh, most of the literature uh, paint a picture of people who are desperate for papers, who are all that. That is when I was in that. That's one of the things I had in mind. So. Okay, so let's push the, the fire thing in Africa. But I realized when I came, about 90% of my congregants are not looking for papers because of immigration. <laughs> now they are okay. So yeah. the, the issues of identity and Christianity is now the major, major thing for them now. Yeah. And so coming in, reading <laughs> things, you may think that the, their needs are looking for jobs, looking for all those things. But I'm realizing that there are there are uh, issues of identity mm -hmm. now very major amongst amongst them because some of them are discovering 
who they are, the youth are discovering whether they are Americans or they are Guardians or all those things. And so yeah. that also shapes how you approach ministry. Mm-hmm. What I have, I have realized is that if we know where they are at, um, um, I, my approach has been, so my first year, uh, my fire, fire, fire thing did not work. Then, <laughs> then I had to revise and see how we can incorporate, you know, the gospel is such that it's so vast and it, it has identity issues in it. Yes. Bring out those issues. That is what I have, I, have, I have realized as a very challenging area for us where you make people see who they are in Christ and who they are as a people and how that, the oneness in that, that is what I think the discipleship focus has been now. The challenge has been the acceptance of, 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 of some of the things that they are used to when it's outside. They've come to see some of them are even now are well to do say that they are seeing the, they are not seeing the, the 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 God factor, the importance of the God factor. The challenge now is these are people that have transitioned from poverty. Now they've made money. They are okay. How do how is the gospel still relevant to these people? You know that is that is that is the the, the challenge I find in them that the Lord is helping us. That you present a mm-hmm. gospel that does that does not touch meet material needs, but their soul, their their spirit. That is the mm-hmm. challenge. The opportunities yeah. about where the resources this uh, this this contest has a lot of resources yeah. for us to de- de- develop. So I'll go back to your word, grow into into it. The people that are listening to us are not the same people that we used to um, talk to even five yeah. years ago. They are yeah. developing. They are seeing a, 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 a certain level of success in terms of mm-hmm. works, in terms of economic work and yeah. all that. And so if you're a pastor and you remain at that level where it's not relevant, mm-hmm. they will come to listen to you, but it won't make any impact. So yeah. that, is, that is it. The second challenge I find also is with the youth. I've mentioned it earlier, who are in transitions, who find a way of worship very boring. <laughs> they find even the local language very boring. They find all those things. So how do we create spaces for these people who are being told in school who they are? You as a pastor or as the lead in leadership need to bring them from their identity, from the Christ point of view. Yeah. And so the youth uh, in, in, in crisis, in crisis, uh, girls thinking they are boys, all those things, and they are affirmed in school, they are affirmed in it, but when they come to the church, how do we present a message that is not condemning, but that can bring truth out of love? Yeah. That, is, that, is, that, is, that is it. And as a pastor, I've been called to come and talk to teenagers who are now uh, who are coming out telling their parents that I am I am not I am not a girl. I'm a boy. How do you walk along this this side? Families. Yeah, these are these are very the reality of our yeah. of our lives. And so we need a gospel that is relevant for that person. Mm-hmm. And I, I, that is that is where we are we are going to. So it's a challenging area for 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 us as missionaries in in the in the western context or in the diaspora to make people see the relevance of the gospel in their current circumstances it will take growing reading more and depending on the holy spirit uh, yeah. it's 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 uh, you know one of the things back home that i have grown out was my expectation of instant results and I pray people are healed. When I when I, I share the gospel, people respond. Here, it's a grow, It's also a challenge. You mm-hmm. have to walk alongside some of yeah. the people. Conversion is a process. Yeah, it's a process. And so that that if when when I preach and maybe people do not respond. Now I don't get hurt. I know <laughs> it's a process. I have sowed the seed. The yeah. Lord will work, will work mm-hmm. with. And so making the greatest challenge I come back to 
is making the gospel relevant to mm-hmm. where where you are firm you 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 understand where what they are going through and out of that you bring a relevant message out of it that is yeah. a, a challenge and, uh, wow. and, uh, and uh, there's also economic challenges they are making yeah. money they don't want to contribute because of their 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 commitment back home and so mm, yeah without money it's 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 a it's a difficult one uh, but mm-hmm. yeah, yeah where people people you know they are making money but they are they are rather willing to support a church back home than where they are fed that is mm-hmm. a challenge in the african church it's not so <laughs> with the western church uh, yeah western context, but in mm-hmm. the in the Ghanaian community that is that is it and some of our of our ministers that came earlier also did not help the prophets yes. they came to take advantage of people and so we have people that are very skeptical about church and and yep. god and so that is that is what we are dealing with now mm. I hope oh, wow. that's... <laughs> oh man that's that's profound yes that's profound you're talking i was thinking of i did an independent study with dr orkerson yes on on the theology of well part of the study required me to study on the theology of africa and and our theology is the theology of power power that's the african theology whether it's in politics it's in the church yeah. it's in the so even when it comes to the instant we we that's that's what it's a theology of power. But then we come to another context. It's the theology, yes, and the theology of power. It's not. How it's love of identity. And so so when you don't understand the context, then you bring a theology of power. People are looking at you, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's just so but I think even back home it's changing though. It's changing, yes. It's changing. It's there is there is just people are in this in between space where you can't remain, and that's why some people even back home are like, "Man, I'm living out from the church because it's just power, power, and I don't, I don't need a miracle. I don't need to have everything." So, what? Yes. <laughs> I'm not looking for a breakthrough, and so those people feel like they don't have a space. Yes. In in the church, so yeah, we have to rethink <laughs> a good yes. balance. Oh my, As you talked a little already about ministering to the third generation. So what would you say to an African who is serving particularly to other Africans in the diaspora or in Europe or wherever they are? They are called to do ministry, but they are, their ministry is not to the indigents of that. Like you're not to, I'm not, I'm, I'm an African, but I'm, ministry, I'm not ministering to Africans. It's mostly Caucasian. So, but there are others who are called to minister, maybe only to Africans. What would you tell them? to help them be effective in their ministry? I think they, they, they should be open. They should be open to, um, to grow. They should be open to be disappointed. And they should be sensitive to where, where they are serving or whoever they, they are serving. Now, I realized that, um, that I read a book, The Power of the Now, whoever is sitting in front of you mm-hmm. should have your attention. You should know a, a bit about about them, and then you should be very sensitive to the issues that are sensitive to them, and be open about mm. your ministry. That they should they should we, we we should be more Holy Spirit dependent. He is doing the conversion and the conviction. Yes. Ours are just mediators, and and so um, if you are called to minister to the African or the diaspora Christians here know where they are now the issues they are dealing with and then read more on the gospel more than what maybe you may you may you you may already know be mm-hmm. ready to read more research more how are people doing it right? because now thanks to the internet a lot yeah. of people are sharing their experiences that when you learn it's not it's not bad to copy the right thing. <laughs> it's it's good to learn. So you yeah. are, just, you know, that um, your way of doing ministry must mm-hmm. be relevant. It's not every time that maybe you stand before people and preach. Sometimes you sit as focus groups. You must be open to some of these things that are that are that are that are that are, that are now relevant to these people. 
and discipleship programs. I think, as I, I mentioned earlier, yeah. it is not just the, the, the demigod, man of God, you come and perform and you go. Now, what the Africans need is somebody they see as a brother who yes. understands their situation. And so you walk alongside with them. You become an uncle to everybody's children. You, you, you walk and then create that space where the kids are even more open to share with you yes. more than sometimes their parents. Mm -hmm. But that will, that will take a lot of openness, a lot of humbling a lot yeah. of listening and a lot of um, reading or watching it is it is it is a total it's a holistic way approach to ministry and so the africans you knew in africa are different from the africans who are in the diaspora they are different they are in transition whether they are westerners or not so just be open open on their side open on your side and leave that is the way to go whilst always updating yourself with the current literature current research what are these people dealing with yeah and that is that is that is the way to go but always make the gospel relevant to them <laughs> that's, that's a good one yeah thank you so much man there's so much wisdom so I much know. wisdom <laughs> time flies when yeah. i and uh, I, I'm thinking, I, I have this quick, I wanted to ask this question, but I'm thinking I, was, I wanted to ask, how does the church in the global South prepare people for transition to ministry in North America? But then I'm thinking back, I'm saying, they don't. it's, I would it's say hard they to don't. prepare someone for an experience <laughs> that you don't know. Yes, but I, I think there's, there are things they can do uh, okay. from there. Um, as we said, we both agree that when we went back, we realized that some of the youth have, are also transitioning. Mm -hmm. And so as they prepare for those youth, those youth are being shaped by the internet. And so it's the same kind of shift that is also happening okay. there. They cannot be stuck in their old ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. They cannot be stuck in their old modes of we think open air preaching is the only way to go. Um, no, if, when, if they, are, they are listening and sensitive to the changes that are happening, even over there, then their ministers will be trained to be open to whatever contest that they are. Because of globalization, the changes mm -hmm. are not that, that, that much. It could be happening even in their contest, but they are not that sensitive or open eyed to see those things yeah. so i think to do the diaspora church a good service ministers should be trained to be to preach a gospel that is relevant and mm -hmm. open to whatever is happening in their yeah. congregation i was i was i mean they should be armed with the skills that they can exegete their their congregation you do a yeah. survey in your church you get you make it an animal so you, you'll be amazed the feedback you get and based mm -hmm. on that you 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 with the help of the holy spirit you 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 tailor your ministry to fit that yeah i see i mean following uh, um social media and even going down there in africa i think the church needs to move from its old ways and start being re relevant to them because a the growing a growing um godlessness that is coming in uh, in Africa, where people don't think the church is any is is very relevant. And yes, five years down the lane, if the church in Africa does not set up um, the uh, spirituality that has taken over in some Western places, witchcraft and all those things, people would rather find solace yeah. in that. So I think preparing people not just for the diaspora church, even for their own context, the church to sit up and review some of their approaches. Um, they cannot be stuck in their old ways. It won't help. Yeah. Man, thank you for saying that because I think, I don't know if it's just lately, my heart has been, especially when it comes to discipleship. Um, yeah. I love them. I love big programs. I, I, I love it. But at times, um, it's like I sit back and I question the mm -hmm. amount it costs to put in that how much discipleship happens in that process? What if 
what if we were very intentional in maybe instead of investing a hundred thousand dollars in one event what if i invested a hundred thousand dollars in 200 young leaders mm. and take them through a process of intentional discipleship equipping them so they go and equip would the impact of that be greater or yeah. would that or would that make me not be the big in quotes emoji mm. that mm. Uh, mm. Yeah, so it, it, it's, uh, and I yeah, know this is, this is, this is looking for trouble for I think the heart is in the same place. It's, yeah. it's, it's most of the discipleship that happens in the, uh, over there, it's assumed people yeah. are born into the church and they grow into the church. But there's not, not intentional ways of bringing them up. And yeah. currently, if you look at all what is happening in missiology and in mission, evangelism has shifted or mission yes. has shifted to discipleship. If your evangelism does not end in discipleship, you will lose all the, all the people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The church really, really needs to ask itself, the church in Africa needs to ask itself a lot of questions and deploy yeah. new methods of mm -hmm. getting close to people and discipling yeah. them. I think our resources should be channeled there. So we we share the same <laughs> the same yeah. thing. Can I just, so one of the things I did back home was when I went and met with her two, two of the nights we just sat and talked mm -hmm. and I remember my last night we talked till like 4.30 a.m. in the morning and it was just questions and answers no sem or no and it was I felt like I wish I did that all week I didn't do any <laughs> conference and yeah, yes. just... yeah. <laughs> okay so wow. what how how could the diversity um, uh, in North America benefit the missional trust? Because that's a good one. That's a good one. I uh, I think that um, the Western Church um, has done a lot and still has a lot of resources that the the global church can, especially churches from the global South, mm -hmm. can can tap into. You know, I I have. There's this three, I've seen that uh, the way the churches are going in Africa, I, I saw that it's through these three, um, I don't know if I should call them pivots, the Western, okay. Western church, the African theology, and then a bit of Pentecostalism. Mm -hmm. the, the church in the West have a lot of resources in terms of articulating our faith, in terms of mm -hmm. everything. Yes. What we can contribute to it is, is maybe moving it from the abstracts to the practical side, which we are good at, but we are not yes. good at um, formulating our theology. Mm. And so that oneness, that ongoing ecumenism, that ongoing conversation is very important for the future of the church, mm -hmm. where we don't just come and take everything he glance into we need to contribute to it but it feeds each other so we shouldn't discard them oh they are a dead west the church in the in the west is is dying i don't believe i don't buy those things we should rather study them listen to them and then pick and learn from some of their mistakes that they maybe they made their yeah. major mistake was that they didn't have a mode of transmitting the faith to the next generation. And so you have very good old Christians who are dying out, but their, their children are not interested. Yeah. We can learn from that mm -hmm. as the African church. We can learn as diaspora church. And then maybe some of the of the of our uh, way of, of, of worship we can also bring. So that continuous conversation needs to go on there. What I've seen happen since I've been here um, in Trinity Hill, I pastored the African church and then there's the Hawaii church. What is happening now that is not helpful for the future is that one Sunday we'll have a joint service. They will sing some African songs and they will think we are mixing. That conversation, ongoing dialogue is deeper than just a Sunday uh, service, one Sunday out of the year, World Communion Day, then we have one. That is not helpful because then we we go back into our shells. We go back into our African way mm -hmm. of work. They go back into their Western way. But there's a need to learn from each other. Ongoing mm -hmm. dialogue. We learn what, uh, the, the things they explain about their faith. 
we learn we we it should be like that that is yeah. the only way not like the dead sea that just receives and then everything in this dies but if it's a mm-hmm. sea, something that is flowing ongoing conversation sometimes yeah. we can actually contribute to even to them in theology how we have yeah. come to understand the faith uh, when we say faith what does it mean to us maybe when yeah. we explain to them this is how we understand it it could help them also to see faith from a different angle so it's a, it's an ongoing thing one church does not see the other as a mission field no 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 we are in this together we are in this together ongoing dialogue yeah. where the, all of us are aiming at oneness that is actually what god has in mind and they were one and they were not ashamed god is one church that he is building that different parts we can learn from each other they have resources we have resources let's continue that dialogue that's the the the, the way i see it but uh, I've seen that they are stuck in a ways. The African church is stuck in the African way, and there's no middle point. That is yeah. not good for the future of the church. That, that's just so amazing because if we don't get to that relational place where we are intentionally listening to each other, learning from each other, then we, we are deficient in some ways. In some and we ways. Don't, the church doesn't really experience the fullness of God's glory because... This person has a portion, the other one has a portion. But if you bring it together, then there is beauty and there's glory. And continue to stay apart. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, am- that's amazing. That's amazing. Man, thank you <laughs> so much. Uh, I'm going to Most ask if you have like last, last thoughts you would like to share. Um, uh... Yes. Um, I'm going to share with my, my colleagues, my friends, my brothers and sisters, whether you are in Africa, or you are serving in a mission field, um, God is on the move. God is still doing amazing things. He is still moving. He's still doing things. What our mission is, is to discern what God is doing and join him in that mission. Mm -hmm. No matter how little it is, no matter how small it is, there is a place for you. There is something. Maybe your place okay. is just that neighbor God has given you. Make sure you know, you discern what God is doing in that neighbor's life and join him in that. Ministry, as we used to know, that has to be a, maybe just a, a pastor, uh, just be with titles. It's no more uh, the, the, the thing. Now, ministry mm-hmm. is functional. What you are doing in that space God has given you. And so don't belittle yourself. Don't think it's not enough. Don't think I must be something before I can do it. God is working. He's doing something new in this la- in this earth or on this, on this side of life. So join him, find out, discern, and don't delay like I did. Don't delay thinking you can serve God through your own means or through your own way. There's a particular thing he wants you to do. I pray that through this encounter, through this conversation, you'll be able to go through to God in prayer, speak to experienced um, Christians who will guide you, but start something. There is something for you to do in the mission of God. Amen. Amen. Wow. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. You are talking Proverbs came to my mind. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, all your heart. and lean not in your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him. He will direct your path. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's God. It's the, the things he knows are far beyond what we know. And so when That's we trust right. and follow him, it's always, mm-hmm. always for our good. And, yes. and, and as we said, uh, theology is not one better than the other. It's, it's, recognizing the theology of power that is still so needed in our generation. It but in is. the theology of identity and love that is still so needed and bringing that together. And Absolutely. yes, so how can we walk in power and walk in love and understand where we are in Christ? That That's Absolutely. going to be explosive. And so if the church in Africa and the church in the globe, in, in North America and Europe or wherever, if we're able to come together and work as one, I believe we are going to make real, real lasting kingdom impact. Thank you so much, Reverend David, for coming.